I want to share with you a, a verse that I aspire to, I think many of us aspire to. It's a verse that, that my, uh, uh, my mother often used when in hard times. It's something that's, that God calls us to. Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How many would like to have that kind of courage and boldness to know that wherever you go, whatever you do, God is there with us and we can be uh, bold and courageous. Jesus, I remember when he was with, with the disciples, remember, and during the storm, the storm came up, they're on the lake, and they, they're all f scared and said, hey, don't you care what happens? And Jesus said, why are you so timid? God is with us. And in celebration of Men and Father's Day, we men are especially called front and center to stand up for good and justice, to stand up for our families, for our communities, to provide and protect I love this verse, this is the Apostle Paul. So simple, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong. God calls you and me to be his people. He's not calling and making a nation of pipsqueaks. He's not making a nation of wimps. God is calling for you and me, boys and girls, men and women, to be champions, to be noble giants that stand firm on principle, that stand for the rights of others. God has this huge plan, and guess who it relies on? You and me. What are the great principles that God wants us to act out? Micah 6, verse 8. These words should be just emblazoned, burned into our minds. We should be able to say this in whatever situation we're in. When we're in tough times, when we're in an argument, when, when we don't know exactly what to do, these words give us the guidance that we need. Micah 6, ver uh, verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Is life really that simple? It really is. These are the, th are you in an argument with someone? What does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. It's not about you. God has a big work going on. Walk humbly with him, and he will take care of things. This vision that God has for you and me is way greater, I think, than any of us imagine. Look at how Ellen White describes who we can be when we put our trust in God. In book education, pages 15 and 16, every human being created in the image of God is endowed with a power akin to that of the Creator. Individuality, power to think and to do. The men in whom this power is developed are the men who bear responsibilities, who are leaders in enterprise, and who influence character. Don't you want wish, aspire to be a person of character, a person of substance, a person who stands up for justice when people around us may be cowering, a person who stands up for the afflicted and, and 
does it firmly and boldly. How can we do that? How can we become that kind of a person? I found a hint, actually, in a great book called Turn the Ship Around by Captain uh, David Marquette. And he took over a ship in the U.S. Navy, a submarine, that was one of the worst in the entire fleet. And in 10 years, it had not gained a single award. And after one year with this crew, the ship became one of the very best in the Navy and won six awards for their best, best of class six years in a row. And all this took place in just one year. He took a ship that was one captain giving orders to 138 sheep and transformed it to 139 leaders who thought for themselves, made decisions, and acted. How did he do that? It was a focus, a clarity on goals and on guiding principles. What are our goals? We just read them. Do justice, love, kindness, walk humbly with your God. I mean, that's what God calls us to do. And clarity on that, thinking about it time and time again, will help us do those things. What are the guiding principles? What does it mean to do justice? What does it mean to love kindness? I'm going to share today, this is a bold promise, a set of principles, biblical principles, that if we follow, I promise, it will transform our lives, our families, the places where we work. Principles that we'll see from the Bible. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you give us your word to guide us and direct us. You call us to be champions, to be priests, to be, to be lights in the dark places that we live. I pray as we examine these biblical principles that you do transform us. You, you lead each one of us to be those champions that you want us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. What are these guiding principles? Take it right from the Bible. Psalms chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Blessed are those who do not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but who delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on his law day and night. They're like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. What are the principles that God calls on us to think about to meditate on, to understand, to apply to all the decisions that we make. The simple Ten Commandments. I hope that as we go through this, just even, even just the first one today, it, it recontextualizes for us the grandeur of the Ten Commandments. I assert that most of us have just a kindergarten level understanding of the Ten Commandments. They're the little rules that mom and dad taught us when we were kids. Why do we need to study those anymore? I mean, uh, which is the Eighth Commandment? Oh, it, it's like we, we don't even know our, our numbering in, in, anymore. I mean, it's like, oh, that's kid stuff, right? Who needs to study that stuff? The Ten Commandments are way, way deeper than that. Let me give you an illustration in mathematics. So I did graduate studies in, in mathematics, have my graduate de degree in, in math, and so, so I, I started a course in kindergarten, two plus two is equal to four, right? I mean, it's like, oh, real nice and simple. But then it didn't take an, until I was in, in, uh, doing graduate studies and, and real analysis and, and other things that really started to look at what does that mean? What does addition mean? I mean... In addition, you can do 
1 plus 1 plus 2 is equal to 1 plus 1 plus 2 is equal to 4. What's that called? That's the associative law of, of, of addition, right? You can also do, you can reverse things around, right? 1 plus 3 is equal to 3 plus 1 is equal to 4. That's commutative law. You know, and uh, you have in, in addition, you have fields and scalars and, and uh, vectors. It's like, what does 2 mean anyway? And, uh, and you have, you have uh, what's, what are called inverses, right? Every number in a field or, or a, a vector uh, space has an inverse. And so if you, have, if you have a 3, guess what? There's a negative 3 that cancels a 3 out. I mean, all these things came in in mathematics. And so I studied that for six years, studying, uh, you know, 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. And guess what I learned after six years? 2 plus 2 is still equal to 4. But it's, there's way more involved than just that. I, I mean, it's something you can, you can spend a lot of time studying and digging into depth that you don't get as a kindergarten student. The Ten Commandments are like that. Newton came up with some simple laws called laws of motion, right, that, that, that describe how uh, objects that are moving, how they interact with each other. The Ten Commandments, friends, are a law of morality. They describe the laws of how free, autonomous individuals act together harmoniously. They describe the moral fabric of the universe. They really deserve more attention than we just got at the knees of our mothers and fathers. Now, I asked you before, and it was kind of silly, but, but I, I failed this, but when I really started to kind of look at the commandments, it's like, oh, yeah, I need to do better at this. I asked, which was the eighth commandment? And it's like, oh, which one is that? You know, and, and some people memorize the order, and they kind of like ABC, you know, if I were to say, what's the seventh letter? Well, let's see, ABC, you know, we do the commandments sometimes that way. So I came up with, for myself, and I'll share it with you now, a little mnemonic, kindergarten level mnemonic to memorize the commandments. How many of you know the, the little ditty, one, two, buckle your, three, four? Exactly, and so I did that thing to memorize the commandments, okay? And so here we are. There's only one, you shall have no other gods before me. Two is for shoe. It's just a thing. Don't make an image, grave an image out, out of it, and, and bow and worship it, okay? So don't have grave, graven images. Three is for the Holy Trinity. Don't take God's name in vain. Four, shut that door. Remember the Sabbath. Five is like a beehive. It's the home. Honor your father and your mother. Six, don't pick up those sticks. Don't murder. Seven, oh, beware of the seven-year itch. Do not commit adultery. Eight, respect the gate. Do not steal. Nine, huh, like a cat that has nine lives, a lie has nine lives. Do not bear false witness. And ten, the perfect ten, don't covet other people's stuff. Very simple rules, but it's amazing how often uh, those come together. And when you're making decisions, what, what Captain uh, Marquette found was when they frame their decisions within their guiding principles, it helped reinforce them and it made them better, right? And so when we're making decisions, we can say, why am I making this decision? I don't want to slander that person's name, right? I mean, I mean uh, so, so we, we can just uh, say that, which is commandment number nine. Nine, number, number nine, okay. Uh, so we're going to look today at the first commandment, okay? Just, just one commandment, and we want, I want to examine three aspects of this commandment, okay? So it reads, Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
the first part of that command I want us to look at. I am the Lord your God. And one of the things to notice here, you don't, you don't get it by reading it in the English, but this is a very personal command. The you here, I am the Lord your God, and also in verse 3, you, those aren't the plural you, like, oh, you all. This is the personal you, okay? This is, a, this is you, okay? You. In fact, to kind of get that, and also the second part of that is we say the Lord, but what is it actually in, in the text? What did God actually say? He gave his name, okay? Usually we'll, uh, we'll say Yahweh or Jehovah, okay? So when you look at it personally, this is God inviting each one of us uh, into this, this relationship. It says, just make it personal. All right, so fill in your name, okay? For me, it's Richard, God says. I am Yahweh, your God, who gives you freedom. Richard, have no other gods before me. Each of you, that's what God is saying to each one of you. As he gathered the children of Israel around and gave them these commands, God was looking at each one of them And he is looking down through history to each one of us. I, he says, Jehovah, Yahweh, I am your God. Don't have any other gods, he says, to you and to me. Second part to look at is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of of slavery. This is a commandment where God establishes his people, his kingdom. He says, I took you out. I took you out from all the different places you were, and I brought you into my own kingdom, my own family. To get how grand this is, Examine the U.S. Constitution, the two most revered documents in this country. The the Declaration of Independence reads like this. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you see the parallel? I mean, God brought together a bunch of people that had been in, in, in bondage and said, you are now free. I brought you out of that slavery. You are now free. Just like in the Declaration of Independence, they said, we are a people and we're no longer subject to that foreign power. We are free. And what is one of the first things they did then? You, did the, you have the Declaration of Independence, and then you have the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our prosperity, do ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. After throwing off the yokes of the foreign power, they declared their independence, and then 
they gave and instituted a bill of rights. And the Ten Commandments are our universal bill of rights. God has given us and defined for us what are those freedoms. Now, am I really off the rails here calling the Ten Commandments, these rules and regulations that we despise when we're growing up, actual bill of rights, our freedoms? Check this out. Apostle James. But those who look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continue in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. When I first thought the commandments, I thought, oh, it's restricting my freedom. But then when you look at it, it says, you have the right to life. Don't murder, right? God gives us the right to life. You don't have the right to take my life from me. You don't have the right to take my properties from me. You don't have the right to slander me. These are universal principles that define the freedoms that God gave to you and me. And the third part of the commandment, then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. Think of the Israelites for a second. They came out of a place with lots of different gods. If you wanted good crops, you pray to the god Anuket, the goddess of the Nile River. If you want to have children, well, there's a god for that. Heket, the frog goddess of fertility. If you're a soldier and you want to be protected in war, well, there's a god for that. Neith, the goddess of war and hunting. Are you afraid what happens after you die? They had a god for that. Horus, Osiris, the lord of the dead. And what if you're afraid of alligators or crocodiles? Well, there's a god for that too, called Sobek, god of the crocodiles. They had all these different gods to do stuff. Imagine if we were ruled by all these gods. Oh, my car, it's not starting. I must pray to Chevy, the god of cars. Oh no, my computer, what's happening? Let me pray to Micro, the god of computers. It's like, God says, no, 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 no. One god. He is our father. If, it, if children don't have, have shoes, whose fault is that? It's a father's fault, right? It's a parent's fault. God says, you need only turn to me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and what happens? He'll take care of everything else. You have only one place you have to go to. Go to God. Don't have all these other, pla- all these other gods, all these other things. God will take care of you. In fact, 1 John 3.1 See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God and that is what we are. The Ten Commandments is so much more than a simple list of rules. They are something that deserve our attention. Like David said in the beginning in Psalms chapter 1, to meditate on it day and light, to understand what they say. Interesting studies done by a couple of doctors, uh, psychologists, Dr. Namie and Dr. Namie. It's actually, actually a husband and wife team. And they, they are the, the, uh, the experts in the field of bullying in the workplace. And what they found was people that get bullied, it confuses them. I mean, someone comes up and starts berating them and, and diminishing them. And it's like, whoa, what's happening? And, and this cloud of confusion takes place, and they, and they feel diminished. They feel bad. But 
once they articulate, I am being bullied, and that is a bully, the cloud disappears. They understand what's going on, and then they can deal with that. The Ten Commandments, God says, these are rights that you deserve, rights of life, of your property, of a good name. And so it, it helps us when we understand those. And we won't understand them until we really dig into and look at them for ourselves and to stand up for other people. The Ten Commandments are the law of love. They define love, law of liberty. They define liberty. They deserve our time. In fact, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, the conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. There's an interesting scholar back in the uh, uh, early 19th century, uh, late, late 18th century, early, 19th, early 20th century. Get those years mixed up. But uh, uh, Louis Agassiz, and he was a, uh, uh, he studied fish and fossils. And he had, a, he had something that he had graduate students that wanted to come in and, uh, and learn about the, the materials. And so Louis Agassiz would give them a fish on a plate. And he said, go look at this fish. And the rule is, you can't dissect it. You can't, you know, take it apart. Just look at this fish. And so, so the, you know, graduate student would say, okay, cool. He got his little fish, you know, whatever type it was. Went and after a couple hours, he'd run back to, to Professor Agassiz. Hey, guess what I learned? He you haven't learned anything yet. It's only been two hours. You know, they go back after, after two days, come back. Hey, guess what I learned? You haven't had time to really examine that fish. Go away. They realized that, that he was expecting that they looked at that little fish for two or three weeks. And then they were amazed at what they learned as they kept on examining that little fish. Friends, the Ten Commandments... These are what God wrote in stone. Ten very simple principles. And he says, meditate on it. And I would venture to say, most of us have not looked at those Ten Commandments seriously in years. Meditate on it day and night. And when we do that, we will transform our lives, our families, our communities. What is your fish? Those are them. And how do you raise up a child so they don't depart? Teach, right? Teach. Repeat. One of the things that Doctor uh, that uh, Captain Marquette found was. The need to repeat over and over and over again the key goals and the guiding principles. Our goals, do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with God. The guiding principles, the Ten Commandments, repeat it over and over and over again. And husbands, fathers, men, we're at the front of that battle. We're the ones who are there to protect our families. When a family, when a child need, needs to be disciplined, who often is called on? The dad, right? And how should we respond? By principle, by what we've learned. And so for, uh, for the uh, men and fathers, we have a couple of reminders. The, uh, these are bookmarks. If, if we could have the deacons uh, uh, hand them out. Bookmarks with verses to remind us. All men and fathers, just uh, I'll give one to each. Hear, O son, my son, and receive my sayings, and the years of thy life shall be long. These are principles for us to reflect and to institute in our homes and in our personal lives.
God calls you and me to greatness, to be noble, to be champions. And I love this verse. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship. That word is poema. We are His poems. We are His stories. We are His songs. God is creating masterpieces with you and me. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Be bold. Be courageous. As we leave here, study those principles and apply them to wherever, wherever we go. And God will do great things with you and me.